as Michael said, I am going to uh, talk about the 100-year study on AI, but it occurs to me, um, I know many of you in the audience, but uh, not everybody. And so um, following on Zubin's uh, example this morning, I'll show the one slide um, version of my research, my own research area. The, the question that I, that I ask in all of my research is, to what degree can autonomous intelligent agents learn in the presence of teammates and or adversaries in real-time dynamic domains. And um, I've been thinking about this for the, the past uh, more than two decades. This does involve uh, control as well as, as prediction. The areas within AI that this um, shows, uh, where my contributions show up are in autonomous agents, robotics, multi-agent systems, and most relevant to today, machine learning, especially reinforcement learning. And I think a lot about trying to create new um, robust reinforcement learning algorithms that especially apply in multi-agent and robotic settings. Um, and uh, trying to come up with, with both uh, theoretical and algorithmic contributions there. I don't have time to show you details of any of those, but I can show just briefly some of the application domains um, where I've tested some of my, my research and used as inspiration. I've been involved for many years in the, uh, the annual robot soccer competitions. These are agents that we've, uh, from more than 10 years ago, that are fully autonomous. They sense, decide, and act. Um, the, uh, that was uh, before Sony, when Sony was making the iBOs, then we moved to these humanoid robots from uh, Aldebaran, now SoftBank. Um, this is the two th finals of the 2012 competition. Our robots are the ones with their the hands behind their back. Um, we ended up winning this competition, and when we got back to the University of Texas, they lit the tower orange for us, which is the highest form of respect in, in Austin. They do it usually when somebody wins a Nobel Prize or the football team wins one game. Um, <laughs> but uh, this was, uh, I guess I'll let, let this run for a second just to, to let you um, see the, uh, the, the robot. And again, these are, these are fully autonomous, um, and here we, we have competitions every year. This is uh, the robot b calmly banking the ball off of the, the goalpost. Um, so this is uh, part of the, the RoboCup competitions that we've had the long-term goal of by the year 2050 to create a team of, of um, uh, humanoid robots that can beat the World Cup champion on a real soccer field. If you come to my lab in, um, at UT Austin, you'll see robots like this wandering around the hallways. This was a video from some collaborative research with my colleague um, Ray Mooney on grounded language learning, where we had people uh, talking to the, or typing to the robot and the robot learning from experience to interpret their language using semantic parsing. Um, and I've also, I had a car in the DARPA Urban Challenge. I won't bother showing you a live clip from, from that. You've all seen some videos of autonomous cars earlier today. But I've also thought for a long time about the multi-agent implications of autonomous driving. Will we still need traffic signals or stop signs? Um, or will our intersections look like this? This is what I think like what autonomous cars will allow us to be able to do in intersections. <laughs> It'll allow things to become much more efficient um, in time and also uh, fuel usage and emissions. So, were I in the, the first session of today's uh, meeting on the frontiers of machine learning, I'd spend the rest of my time talking about reinforcement learning algorithms and their applications to, um, to multi-agent systems and robotics. And actually, were I in the, the last session on um, machine learning in research and commercial communities, I'd tell you all about my, uh, my startup company, Kojitai, or at least a little bit about it. Um, but in, I'm instead have been asked to, uh, to kick off the section on machine learning in society. And in that capacity, I'm going to talk about uh, an opportunity I had over the past year to, to, be, to serve as the study panel chair um, of the first study panel in a long-term, 100-year study. Um, and uh, I'll tell you both about the, the process of, or how this report came about, the process by which we went uh, we went through to try to write it and some of the content of it. Um, but it's, uh, I, I don't have time to tell you all of, all of the content. It's mainly will serve also as an advertisement. And I hope at, at the end of this, if you haven't read it already, that you will um, be inspired to, to read the details. So the 100 year study was, came out of an endowment by uh, Eric Horvitz and his wife, Mary. Um, and the framing document, it was, it was founded, oops, founded in 2014. And uh, with the goal of supporting a longitudinal study of uh, influences of artificial intelligence advances on people and society, 
centering on periodic studies of developments, trends, futures, and potential disruptions associated with machine intelligence. And also, key in a key way, trying to come up with proactive efforts, tr uh, trying to figure out what recommendations and guidance can be made to try to um, sort of maximize the chance that AI technologies could be used for, for, for good, for positive outcomes before, it was, before it's too late. And uh, the roots of this were a, the AAAI presidential panel on the long-term um, AI futures that happened in Asilomar in 2008-09. Just so happens there was another meeting in Asilomar just uh, a week ago. Um, this is, uh, but this one, I know there were at least two people in the audience today who were at this, uh, at this meeting in this picture. I was a part of the meeting as well. Unfortunately, I wasn't physically there. Um, I was, but I, I had called in and there was sort of a small, small group of us who uh, explored the potential long-term societal influence of, of AI advances. And this was when Eric uh, Horvitz was the president of, of AAAI. And that's sort of when the thinking behind this, uh, the AI 100 study got started, I believe. Um, but then, as, as I said, the, it, you know, fast forward about five years, uh, there was an endowment um, provided by, by Eric that, um, that then launched the, the AI 100 study. And structurally, um, the AI 100 study consists of a standing committee with the chair of Barbara Gross currently and six members, one of whom, Tom Mitchell, is here in the, in the audience. And, um, and the standing committee, their first, uh, you know, they decided on the, the structure of how this, how this uh, 100 years would play out and decided that there would be periodic study panels. And so they recruited me to, to lead the, uh, the study panel starting in 2015. There, I guess uh, conceptually there could have been two chairs, but uh, there was only I was the only dot in 2015. Maybe there'll be more dots in the in later years. But they recruited me, and then I worked with them to recruit a study panel, and then we were given um, the, a charge by the standing committee to come up with um, with an artifact. I mean, actually, there was a lot of freedom. I'll go into to that. It wasn't necessarily going to be a report, um, but the study panel uh, convened. We spent a year coming up with, our, um, with this, this artifact and then disbanded. The standing committee, though, stay, stays on. Um, and they'll presumably uh, recruit a, uh, another study panel chair. It won't be me, for sure. Um, I've done, this was a lot, a, a, a lot of work, but uh, um, well worth it, I believe. Um, but they'll, there'll be another study panel. And the plan is for this to happen every, every five years um, till at least 2115. I understand that there's actually uh, the endowment is such that it can continue well beyond uh, 100 years as well. But you know, 100 years is a nice round number. So it's the 100 year study um, on AI. It was, uh, there was some debate at the outset of where this should be, should be archived or hosted. Should it be um, you know, at a professional organization? Um, should it be at a university? I think that the, uh, from what I understand, the, the process um, hit on a, a, ended up going to be um, deciding on a university because there's, uh, you know, professional organizations tend to come and go. Universities, at least, uh, it seems, have, have much more longevity and stability. And so it was decided that it would be housed at uh, Stanford and that be part of the Stanford uh, Digital Ar Archive. And the, the intended audiences are, are multiple. There's, it's the outcomes of the reports were, designed, were supposed to be for AI researchers, the general public, industry, and policymakers. So we had to come up with something that would speak to all of these, all of these groups. And the charge we were given, so the standing, com uh, the standing committee came up with a charge to deliver to me and the, the study panel, which was as follows. It was to identify the possible advances in AI over the next 15 years and their potential influences on daily life, to specify the scientific engineering and legal efforts needed to realize these developments, and consider the actions needed to shape outcomes for societal good, deliberating on design, ethical, and policy challenges, with a focus being on large urban regions. Typical, a typical North American city. Now, I don't, uh, it was emphasized, or I would like to emphasize, it wasn't meant to be restricted to North American cities. Um, could apply to really first world cities around the, um, around the world. But the idea was, it was that uh, we, you know, there was some focusing um, as opposed to on, uh, on you know, there'd be a different set of questions that might arise in, in, third, world, uh, in third world cities. Um, and the, the point of, of focusing on an urban center or on cities was that it brings together many different aspects of AI, many different applications. Um, it's sort of a focusing device. 
and also serve to scope out the many thorny um, questions that come up if you, if you, keep, uh, if you scope in military um, uh, aspects of artificial intelligence, which may be the topic of a future study panel. But for this one, it was about uh, the effects of AI in a typical North American city. And you know, so this was, I took this as sort of, uh, you know, at first when I was invited, um, I definitely did not jump at this opportunity uh, quickly. Um, this was a, you know, a, it seemed very exciting, but also seemed very daunting in many ways. It was both an opportunity um, and a challenge. And, you know, the, in some ways, the, the things that, that, uh, that the aspects or that the challenge that was given to me was um, energizing, but also um, I didn't know where to go at first. There was sort of a carte blanche given with respect to format. Is it going to be a document? Is it going to be a set of websites? Is it going to be um, other, kind, other forms of multimedia? Um, there was even flexibility on topic. There was a charge, but it was still it was very, it was very broad, and I was invited to, to help shape what, that, uh, what the topic would be. Um, I was asked to come up with something that would be topical now at a time of great interest in AI where there was um, a lot of progress in industry. There were, uh, simultaneously, we knew that there were some uh, studies going on out of the White House. Ed Felton, who's here, was, was uh, chairing those. There's also a lot of, of ink being spilled about artificial intelligence, and there, there continues to be. And also fear-mongering, as, as, um, uh, as Rao was saying over lunch. The, uh, you know, at, earlier today, someone said, uh, or um, yeah, it was, it was uh, said, you don't really need to know about a derivative to, uh, to do deep learning. And as Rao pointed out at lunch, you don't have to have any background in AI to, to render an opinion about what the impact of AI will be and, uh, and how it might destroy the world. And, um, and so you know, we, we had to come up with something that was, would be a report from the more, you know, um, let's say, uh, insider view. Something that would give a balance, but, but not, uh, not one that would be overwhelmingly positive or only you know, biased in a positive way either. That would be a balanced view taking into account the, possi uh, the realistic possibilities, barriers, and risks of artificial intelligence. So this was you know, no, small, um, no small challenge. There were other studies going on at the time, including the White House studies, and there's been many other reports coming out. One of the things that made this most appealing and exciting and challenging um, was the longitudinal aspect. So as well as being topical now, it also had to be relevant over time. The first of a series of five-year studies that um, would both set a precedent for future studies. There hadn't been any previous ones. Presumably, it'll set a pattern, although you know, future study panel chairs will be able to, to um, you know, also have license to change things. Um, presumably, it's going to look back, be looked back upon every, every five years as this 100-year study proceeds. And so, uh, you know, af but after much, uh, much thought, I decided to, to take it on. And, um, and the first task then was to invite panelists. Um, and this itself was, it was a challenging task. What, you know, who should be involved in this study, as, as we've talked about on the previous panel? The people involved will bring their own biases and experience to this, um, to this effort. So we tried to balance across areas, seniority, gender, to some extent geography, although North America was, was uh, called out in the, um, in the charge. And so we ended up with the, following, uh, with the following great set of people. And it was a real honor to work with everybody here. Um, many academics with expertise in core artificial intelligence, um, but also some people with expertise in areas such as law, Ryan Kahlo, um, some people from industry like uh, Rodney Brooks, Astro Teller. Um, people thinking more about the social uh, aspects of, of AI, um, Anno Saxenian, and, and so forth. So it was, uh, you know, we th I think we came up with a, with a great uh, group of people, and then we, we moved forwards. Um, and uh, sort of one of my roles here was to shape the process, and I put a lot of thought into how to do this. I've, given the, the time constraints, I'm not going to go into all the detail of how we ended up um, generating what we did. But one of the first questions was, you know, given this charge of do something relevant now and that will stand the test of time, what should it be? Should it be a report, web pages, YouTube videos, multimedia? Actually, the early sentiment of all the panelists was the, a report is going to be one of the least impactful things we could do. So you know, the people said, you know, who's going to read another 50-page, 100-page report? Let's do something else. And so we thought about all the other something else's we could do. Um, 
And in the end, we said, OK, well, at least, at least let's start with the report. We know how to do that. Let's do the report. And then that can you know, be the jumping off point for everything else. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. But uh, you know, then there was also what topics should we, we talk about. And you know, that was, there, there was a wide open set of possible topics when you're talking about AI in a typical North American city. So we spent about, we had about three or four monthly phone calls where we just came up with an outline for a document. Um, we decided that the, you know, we would do a, doc, a document, as I said, that the parts with real impact, the videos and all that would come later. Um, and so we decided, okay, let's do a, uh, um, a in-person meeting in February. We did some, uh, actually this is, uh, I'm low on time, so I, I won't talk about it. We did some, some uh, writing exercises where a lot of the text was actually generated on site uh, during a very intensive writing day. Um, we then went months of back and, back and forth with a professional writer. Lots of, had a final in-person meeting to, to sort of generate the callouts for the report. Lots of feedback and polishing. And to make a long story short, we ended up putting so much effort into the report that there was no, no uh, energy left to do anything but the report. Um, but we, we did uh, put a lot of effort into really making it a polished document and ended up with something that I think we're all very, very proud of. Um, the structure is that there's a, and it's available online, it was released in September, there's a preface for context and then uh, an executive summary. This is the whole uh, executive, well, here's the executive summary, so a page in a little bit. So you don't have an excuse of I don't have time to read your report. If you have a minute, you can read the executive uh, summary. There's then a, sort of the next level of our three-layer hierarchy, there's, a, there's an overview, uh, which is five pages. So there you just saw that. So if you have five minutes or so, you can get a good overview of the document. And then there's the rest of it. So, um, and, but all through it, we do have these call-outs in the, in the margins. Um, it's all, and actually all told, it's only about 50 pages. Um, it's actually, you know, we made a lot of effort to make this quite accessible to, to everybody. It's got an introduction defining artificial intelligence with our definition of it um, and current research trends, um, including deep learning, of course, but many others. It then the real core of the report is going into eight areas with likely urban impact by the year 2030, where in each of them we looked back 15 years, what's changed in those areas over the past 15 years, and then what do we project will happen in the next 15 years, and tried to identify the opportunities, barriers, and realistic risks in each of them. Um, and then we also had some policy and legal issues, uh, the current status, and also recommendations for the future. So the eight areas of focus that we did um, zero in on are listed here. I'll talk just briefly about, uh, about three of them. But really, the, the first, I should say, the first four and the last one are sectors of the you know, economic sectors. The other three here are more cross-cutting that have influence in, in all of them. And there's sort of commonalities and differences among them. There's some that have to do with hardware, partnering with people, uh, some that have, uh, they all sort of to some degree deal, have uh, the aspect of building trust um, and interpersonal interaction in, in, uh, within entertainment. So, and in all of them, you know, there's, there's a progression from gathering data to predictive models to decision, uh, decision making models. Transportation is one that there's already been a lot of, of talk about today. That's sort of the least controversial that there's going to be a change to the trans transportation infrastructure by the year 2030, certainly probably much before then. Um, but we, we uh, you know, observe in the report that transportation is likely to be the first domain where the public is asked to trust artificial intelligence on a large scale. And you know, what, what that means for, for us as a community moving forwards, it's both, a, you know, again, an opportunity and a challenge. Um, there's been talk today already about some of the problems and challenges that, uh, that come up, so I'm, I'm going to skip sort of through, through this. Um, more in the medium term, we did, there is a big section in the report on public safety and, and security. Um, two sample uh, applications that, that I'll, I'll call out. One is uh, the problem of uh, fraud detection. How do we tell wh which transactions are fraudulent um, on credit cards? And, uh, you know, there's data about this. There's records of fraudulent and legitimate transactions. There can be predictive models that identify uh, features of fraudulent transactions, and you can move uh, towards decision-making mod um, uh, models that would actually aut autonomously terminate um, fraudulent transactions of, of certain kinds. And these lead to, you know, there's, there's uh, cl classification techniques that are quite mature that can be brought to bear um, for this. A risk that's been, um, that's already been talked about here is encoding or even magnifying human biases in these decisions. We talk about that extensively in the report. 
one, I've gotten a lot of feedback since I wrote this, and one thing that, uh, that somebody did point out to me is that um, we, we talk in the report, and there was also talk today, earlier today, about the challenge of eliminating bias in machine learning algorithms, and, uh, or identifying it and eliminating it. Um, but really, that's, I think, the wrong way to look at it. Every machine learning algorithm has bias, right? And uh, in fact, you know, my, my machine learning instructor when I was in, in graduate school is sitting right here, and that was one of the first lessons, lessons was, was, you know, the, a machine learning algorithm has bias. And uh, we're never going to be able to eliminate that. Instead, what we need is to be able to identify or control what biases are okay, make them consistent with what we want to have um, in the algorithms, and be able to identify uh, you know, what they are. Right? If, if, if we're making a lending decision, we do want to be biased towards people who are more likely to repay their loans. Right? That's a form of bias. Um, is that one that we would, we, you know, that's okay? Probably yes. There might be other biases that are not okay, so we want to be able to control for those biases. Um, another within this uh, public safety and security, predictive policing may come up uh, in, the, in the next 15 years. Again, bias is a key issue there, that can, but uh, you, know, you can imagine there's a lot of crime data right now, and you could come up with predictive models for pro pro um, probability of, of high crime areas. And then finally, just a word on, um, we also devote some time in the report and some space in the report to meeting the needs to applications that could meet the needs of low resource communities. One with uh, applications that don't necessarily have commercial, um, high commercial impact or co potential, but yet could um, help in society. Um, there have been some examples of this. Um, Machine learning for preventing lead poisoning in children, trying to find which houses to inspect uh, for lead. Um, so you can imagine developing predict uh, predictive models um, for houses that need lead inspections for, their, for paint. Another is, is social networks for raising HIV awareness in homeless youth. It turns out uh, that the ho homeless youth are at a much higher risk for HIV, but they distrust authority. Um, and so trying to identify through social media who are the, um, the most influential peer leaders and educating them and hoping that this will disseminate um, out into their communities. Uh, there's already been a decision aid piloted in Los Angeles um, that has led to the, showing some increase in, in HIV testing. So um, that's just a small sample of, the, of the, you know, some of the issues within these three topics. And of course, I haven't even touched on some of these other topics. Again, I, w I don't have time in this talk to go into the full details, um, but there are, like I said, many summarizing callouts in the report. I'll just highlight uh, a few of my favorites, um, that, uh, the ones in green here. So misunderstandings about what AI is and is not could fuel opposition to technologies with the potential to benefit everyone. Poorly, poorly informed regulation that stifles innovation would be a tragic mistake. So we talk about sort of what are the, the ways to go about um, regulation. Um, and uh, I think very, uh, very topical today, society is now at a crucial juncture in determining how to deploy AI-based technologies in ways that promote rather than hinder democratic values such as freedom, equality, and transparency. Um, and so these are all, this is a sort of hints at some of the topics that we go into in the report. Maybe I'll find one more that I highlighted uh, before closing. Autonomous transportation will soon be commonplace and as most people's first experience with physically embodied AI systems will strongly influence the public's perception of AI. I foreshadowed that earlier. There's one other actually that I would like to, um, uh, that's a health related one. Um, that's an education related one. Um, let me see if I can f if I have it here quickly. Um, oh, I'm, uh, so I, I would also, also say just with, with regards to jobs, uh, we also ta talk about how it's very easy for people to, to predict or relatively easy for people to predict what jobs will be um, replaced or, or changed by AI technologies and much more difficult for people to predict what new jobs will emerge. And, uh, and so this is one of the points we make also in, the, in the, um, the employment and workplace section. So I encourage uh, everybody, if you go to this website, you can find the report. If you do read it and find it interesting or useful or even objectionable in any way, uh, please let me know. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm um, very happy to receive uh, feedback, pass it back to the standing committee that may influence what goes into next, uh, the, the report in, in five years from now. Um, and with that, I'd like to, uh, to thank you again for inviting me and be happy to take any questions.